Hi, it's Dwyer. It's Thursday, August the 16th, 2018. Let's talk boxing, but first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, I've been away a little bit, uh, dealing with work-related stuff, right? Happens every summer. Just when I'm about to grab a bottle of wine and hit the cafe, uh, I get hit with court papers. It happens. But I have kept my eye on boxing, and I did want to talk about a couple of things that are in the news. Right? Recently, Oscar De La Hoya, and understand, if you're a little bit older like me, you remember Oscar when he was one of the best fighters in boxing. Understand, Oscar fought Floyd Mayweather. That was a split decision in Mayweather's favor. In other words, one of the judges thought Oscar won the fight, right? Oscar, um, Oscar is a guy I keep track of, right? Now he's a promoter. I'm just telling the younger generation he was a hell of a fighter. Oscar is Canelo's promoter. And Oscar the other day was saying that Canelo's failed drug tests for clenbuterol were not going to taint his legacy, right? Folks, promoters have to promote their fighter. They have to put the best foot forward uh, in terms of public image for their fighters, right? But make no mistake about it, Canelo is already tainted. Right? You already have a lot of people out there who hear that a superstar fighter has failed a couple of drug tests who are going to question the integrity of his past fight results, especially when those fight results include close fights like his fight against Arislandi Lara. Right? So make no mistake, whoever wins this Golovkin fight, Canelo's been tainted what I want young fighters to think about is the risk involved in using PEDs, right? Understand, too, the drug testing protocol. You have two bites at the apple. You have an A sample and a B sample. In my opinion, the only way that a fighter avoids heavy public scrutiny from fans like me over a failed drug test is if after failing the A sample the B sample comes back negative. That's not what happened with Canelo. Right? It's not. So I just want people to remember the impact that cutting corners or to use a better word in my opinion cheating does to a fighter's career. I'm just telling you, a few years ago, it was an open question about whether Floyd Mayweather was better than Antonio Margarito. I personally thought, based on styles, that Margarito would give Mayweather all he could handle. I was prepared to place a bet if that fight was announced, because I knew Mayweather would be a big favorite. Well, then Margarito was busted busted with tainted gloves before his fight against Shane Mosley. Then, of course, he goes out in the fight and he gets his butt kicked by Shane Mosley. Didn't look like he had the punching power. Well, understand other fighters who had fought Margarito in the past, notably Miguel Cotto, then started to say, look, look at the film of my fight. Look at my face. The injuries I have don't look natural. He may have had tainted gloves in that fight. Right? The issue was so big that Margarito's trainer, Javier Capitillo, got suspended. When we talk about the great fighters from Margarito's era, and keep in mind, this is a guy who beat Sergio Martinez, one of the better middleweight champions. Margarito's name is not mentioned. Right? We question everything the guy did. Right? There are many people who point out that Margarito suddenly 
got a lot of power later in his career. Right? The inference is that his team was involved in a protocol that got him into the ring with tainted gloves in more than one fight. Understand, he was only busted once, folks. So let's be clear here. For Canelo Golovkin, assuming there's a winner of the fight, right? And it's not a draw or, you know, headbutt, um, disqualification, odd ball ending. Let's say there's a winner on the merits, right? Just understand that if Canelo wins this fight, there are people who are still going to question his past fights. Understand if Canelo loses the fight, if he loses the fight, then you're going to have an even bigger group saying, gee, off the juice, this guy can't perform. Let's go further. Canelo is in shape, right? Looks like he works out a lot. I'm just telling you that if he comes in the ring after a positive clenbuterol test, right? If he comes in the ring and he looks, let's say, as flabby as Lucas Brown did against Dylan White. Lucas Brown, like Canelo, tested positive for clenbuterol, lost his heavyweight title as a result of it. You're going to have a lot of people even questioning the integrity of Canelo's body, whether or not his in-shape appearance was chemically enhanced. So, all I'm saying is this, right? Right now in the United States in baseball, you have a lot of guys with great records, right? Barry Bonds, Mark McGuire, Rafael Palmeiro. Roger Clemens, right? Four of the best ball players I have seen in my life. Sammy Sosa, let's make it five, right? And there are guys who won't vote for them for the Hall of Fame, even though their numbers dwarf, dwarf the numbers of a lot of guys getting in the Hall of Fame, right? Now, boxing has been a not in a wink type deal for years. Right? I believe there are fighters out there right now who I'm sure many fans are looking at the fighter and they're saying, gee, this guy looks too much like a weightlifter today compared to how he looked a few years ago. Right, But we don't have the positive drug test to publicly say, I knew something was fishy. You do right now with Canelo. Right? As much as I respect Oscar De La Hoya, as much as I respect Canelo, who longtime subscribers know I've been talking about since he was a teenager here online, right? Make no mistake, he's been wounded badly by the positive drug tests. Right? I know many of you have written comments to past videos in the comment section. Um, saying, hey, other fighters, other fighters tested positive for clenbuterol in the past, right? Just to understand, this is 2018. As I said earlier in this video, the same drug costs Lucas Brown the heavyweight championship. Same drug, right? This is a serious matter. It's going to be part of Canelo's resume, regardless of what happens in the Golovkin fight. Let me also say this too. Track the interviews. Normally, what fighters say before a fight goes in one ear and out the other with me, right? Everyone wants to look like they're Superman before a fight. Everyone wants to convince you that their opponent isn't worthy of sharing the same ring with them. Right? But understand, not every fight has an over-under of 11 and a half rounds, <laughs> right? Where you have two punchers, both of whom are determined to prove that the first fight, which ended in a draw, was a fluke. Right? I'm just saying, I'm just saying, 
Look at your casino. I like the under 11 and a half rounds. I do think Golovkin wins it. Part of my betting portfolio is going to be Golovkin simply to win. But I'll be shocked if that fight goes the distance. In part because, right, this is a post-positive drug test fight. I'm assuming everyone is going to show up clean for this one, right? I'm one of those who, when I hear a fighter has failed a drug test, right, in my mind, that increases the odds of a knockout when that fighter fights his next fight, right? Some things might be different this time. Let me also say this too. Mia St. John, a pretty good fighter, look at her record, came out and said, hey, you know what? For many of my fights, right? Many of my fights, she said she was juicing, right? Many, folks, I just want you to know that just like Lance Armstrong was able to juice in cycling for years without getting caught, you have a fighter who's under the auspices of these sanctioning bodies, right? These boxing commissions. And she's telling you, I fought for years, folks, years. And I was juicing and I wasn't caught. She even goes further and says, hey, I used a catheter. Sometimes I used other people's urine, right? Mia St. John goes even further than that and says, look, everybody's juicing and boxing, right? Of course, people who juice think everyone's juicing, right? I'm not saying everyone is, but people who juice think everyone's juicing. If you're a casual fan of boxing, you're kidding yourself. If you think in a sport where the winner goes on to bigger and better things where champions get paid more money than contenders, where there's a big gap between being a journeyman and being a contender, where one fight can change your career. You're kidding yourself if you don't think there are more Mia St. John's in this sport. Right? There's a public narrative, hey, the meat was tainted. Then there's the reality, catheter use to beat drug tests. Right? The urine's not even yours, folks. Right? People studying clearance times on drugs. You know, if I take this then, how long will it take to get out of my system? Maybe I need to lift weights and juice here and then, you know months later have the fight. Understand, Vada and these testing outfits are relatively new. Right? Also understand, too, you have a lot of fighters who retire, right? They'll say, hey, man, I'm retired. This way, they're outside of programs. No one's looking at them. And then, of course, the guy looks a little bit more muscular than he used to. Right? Pay close attention to the Mia St. John interview on drug testing. It's eye-opening. Now, let's talk about a fight that I'd like to see happen. Many people disagree with me. Shane Mosley thinks that the smaller guy is going to get killed, right? Members of the guy's own family don't like the fight, right? His father, who's a trainer, right, has trained champions. Fernando Vargas was part of this gym at one point. Right? And his brother, who's one of the best trainers in boxing today, don't like the idea of future Hall of Famer Mikey Garcia taking on Errol Spence. Right? Widely viewed by the boxing public as one of the very best in the sport, pound for pound. Right? He certainly is at the welterweight division where he owns one of the titles. But let me just say this. Right now, I have no doubt that Errol Spence is a warrior. Right? Understand, I've taken Spence in some tough fights. I took Spence when he crossed the Atlantic to fight Cal Brook for the title in the United Kingdom. Right? I know Spence is a warrior. 
I know Spence is the kind of soldier who wants to fight in the trenches. Not everyone is, right? Spence, to me, if I had to describe his game, is a mid to short range hooker, right? But what I want people to do is return to that Cal Brook fight, right? In the early rounds of that fight, Cal Brook was noticeably faster, noticeably faster than Errol Spence. Looked like the better athlete and was landing straight punches flush on Spence. Right? You want to look at the film? Again, look at the early rounds of Kell Brook against Errol Spence. I know Mikey Garcia has looked at that film. I'm sure he has. Right? Let me just say this too. Look at the weigh-in of Mikey Garcia against Robert Easter, right? Weigh-in sometimes tell you a lot. This one did. Look at Mikey Garcia's neck, right, folks? It's thin. <laughs> it's thin and it's long. In other words, the guy who showed up to the weigh-in against Robert Easter was a very slimmed down version of Mikey Garcia. Now the Easter fight was at 135, right? People view Mikey as a guy at 135 jumping to 147 to fight Errol Spence. Folks, I believe Mikey Garcia weighed more than 147. at the time of the fight against Robert Easter. In other words, Garcia did whatever boxers do to make weight the day before the fight. Then showed up more than 10 pounds heavier. This is a 5'6 guy, right? Shows up more than 10 pounds heavier for the fight. Now what is the illusion? Is the illusion the idea of Mikey being viable at 147? Or is the illusion Mikey actually making weight at 135? Does Mikey even belong at 135? Let me just say, I know there are those of you who want him to fight Vasyl Lomachenko. Folks, that's a harder fight than Errol Spence. Right? Lomachenko's going to be all over the ring. First off, to fight Lomachenko, you're going to have to skip dessert. Right? You're going to have to lose the weight. Mikey's going to have to get back to the slim neck Mikey Garcia that he was for the weigh-in against Robert Easter. Then after losing the weight, he's going to be in the ring against one of boxing's best athletes, and Lomachenko's going to be moving all over the ring. Folks, that's a harder fight style-wise than fighting Errol Spence, who's going to be right in front of you. In fact, Spence is going to be mid to short range. He's going to be up in Mikey's face. Right? Let me say this too. You know, Kell Brook uses his legs for defense. That's why when he fights Golovkin, you'll notice Golovkin literally run over to Kell Brook. Very uncharacteristic of Golovkin. You'll notice Golovkin run over to Kell Brook to smother him, right? Kell Brook is a guy who has great legs. So Kell Brook would be in the pocket, then he just back away from the pocket, right? He has the timing and stuff like that. Understand, if you use your legs for defense, right, you're not in a position to block shots. The other guy is walking you down. You're not blocking shots and able to counter, keeping the other guy honest. In other words, if I back away, I'm not standing right in front of the guy to parry the shot, then drop the hammer with the same hand. Mikey Garcia is much better defensively than Cal Brook, right? I know the Cal Brook people are cringing, hey man, we're here for the truth. 
right? Mikey Garcia is much better defensively than Kell Brook. Kell Brook's winning his fight against Errol Spence after the early rounds. If Kell Brook had the ability to just operate from the pocket and block the shots, we're dealing with the hooker. The punches are coming from the outside. I know Spence jumps around to change the angles. I'm just telling you there's some fighters who would make him pay for jumping around. In other words, Spence is here. He jumps over here. Keep in mind, he's throwing a hook. When he moves his feet to reset, a sharpshooter is going to hit him while he's in transition. Mikey Garcia is that kind of sharpshooter. Now understand, I know Spence is big for Welter. I'm sure Spence would come in to the fight weighing what? Probably the high 150s. Right? Even though Mikey probably comes in above 147, right? I'm guessing Spence comes in above 156. Okay, fair enough. And Spence is going to be not just physically bigger, he's going to be aggressive collapsing the pocket. But folks, this is championship level boxing. Understand, in boxing, there are fight styles. There are fight styles that make over-aggressive, bigger fighters pay for their aggression. And Mikey Garcia has that style. Let's talk about the tip-off, and it involves another Hall of Famer who was actually part of Mikey Garcia's fight against Robert Easter. Right? That Hall of Famer was Hall of Fame broadcaster Al Bernstein, who did the fight. Right? Keep in mind, in boxing, you have Hall of Fame fighters, you have Hall of Fame referees, you have Hall of Fame announcers. When a guy's a Hall of Fame announcer, let's just say he's seen a few fights. He's been around the block a few times. Now you had Al Bernstein, who knows Mikey Garcia's style. On the telecast, watching Garcia be front foot heavy against Robert Easter. And Bernstein repeatedly tells the viewer, you know, this is not the style that Mikey Garcia is most comfortable with. Garcia actually would prefer that you come to him. Understand, as good as Garcia looked against Easter, that's Garcia's plan B, right? That's not even Garcia at his best. Garcia's at his best when you're trying to collapse the pocket on him. In other words, he has a lot of Floyd Mayweather in him. Right? I think Mayweather made a career off of guys trying to bum rush him. So Mayweather, as he did against Ricky Hatton, has them walking into check left hooks. Folks, that's also Mikey Garcia's game. Mikey Garcia wants Errol Spence to try to treat him like Jeff Horn treated Manny Pacquiao. Understand, Garcia's style is different than Pacquiao's style. Right? Pacquiao's style is speed and quick strikes. Garcia's style is you come in, try to collapse the pocket on him. This is Garcia at his best. And Garcia then makes you pay. He throws the much straighter punches than Errol Spence. He has the hand speed advantage on Errol Spence. He has the defensive advantage on Errol Spence. Let me also say, too, what Will Chamberlain said generations ago applies. No one roots for Goliath. Right? You see bigger Errol Spence, who's going to be the favorite in the fight, try to collapse the pocket on smaller Mikey Garcia. And people are going to start rooting for the smaller fighter. Right? In many ways, this fight would be this generation's version of Oscar De La Hoya against Manny Pacquiao. The difference is in that fight, if you look at the fight today, Pacquiao's the hunter. Here, Mikey Garcia would be the hunted. And the secret to this fight is that that's what Mikey Garcia wants. 
right? He wants some big guy who he has faster hands than, who he throws straighter punches than, who he can get low on. He wants that guy to be in front of him, trying to get him on his back foot because there are few people in the sport who know their way around the deep pocket better than Mikey Garcia, right? So what I want people to do is to listen to Hall of Fame Al Bernstein's analysis, right? He's telling you, look, Mikey's aggression here. This is different than Mikey before he took time off from the sport. When Mikey liked people to come to him. Folks, Garcia's unbeaten today. Understand, Garcia has let people step to him, right? The Orlando Salido fight. Mikey's over by the ropes. One of the knockdowns is Mikey over by the ropes. Salido runs in because that's his style. Mikey times it perfectly. Contrast Mikey hitting Orlando Salido as he runs over the ropes with Floyd Mayweather hitting Ricky Hatton as Hatton runs over to the ropes. Right? Understand you don't have to be a hunter to be dominant in boxing. So let me just say this. I believe now is the perfect time for this fight to happen because I believe the public is a little bit confused. Right? They just saw Manny Pacquiao against Jeff Horn. And the feeling was, gee, Jeff Horn is too big for Pacquiao, who, by the way, at one point had the title at 154, right? But keep in mind, public consciousness, we get caught up in the moment sometimes. We don't look at the history. So the feeling was, oh, Jeff Horn was, you know, roughing up Manny Pacquiao, had Pacquiao over by the ropes. We forget that the guy who got the warning from the ref was actually Jeff Horn, right? We forget that Manny doesn't like to be on his back foot. Whereas Mikey Garcia is comfortable on his back foot, right? So the public saw a bigger man beat Mikey Garcia, right? They forget that. <laughs> They forget that Terrence Crawford came up from a lighter weight. Think about that. And stop Jeff Horn. That's how important styles are. This is the same Crawford who's on his back foot against Victor Postal for stretches of that fight. Then, of course, we saw Eris Landy Lara lose to Jared Hurd. Right? Jared Hurd, big guy, on his front foot. Right? Understand, if he doesn't catch Lara and drop him in that last round, I wonder who wins that fight. But I'll just say this. The feeling was that Jared Hurd was too big for Lara. But Lara, at his best, is like he was against Canelo. Right? That fight, what was the knock on Lara? Lara kept leaving the pocket. That's a different type of fighter than Mikey Garcia. Mikey Garcia is not running around the ring. His style isn't to get on a back foot and move away from the pocket and, you know, pepper you and, you know, have you looking slow-footed. No. <laughs> Mikey would want to fight a Canelo. Right? Because Mikey would understand. Now, Canelo throws straighter punches than Errol Spence. Don't get me wrong. But, but Mikey would understand that he would have opportunities, the same opportunities that Cal Brook had against Errol Spence, right? He would have opportunities to land that same straight right hand that he lands several times against Robert Easter, right? He would have an opportunity to show the offensive skills that had unbeaten Robert Easter basically capitulating the last third of the fight, right? In survival mode, the last third of the fight. So understand, this is different than Jeff Horn, Manny Pacquiao. This is different than Canelo, Arislandi Lara, or Jared Hurd, Arislandi Lara. This is the smaller fighter who wants the larger fighter 
to come find him. Because when he does, and when the bigger fighter tries to open up, the smaller fighter understands that he's going to have windows of opportunities. First, he's going to know where the punches are coming from. Spence throws punches a little wide. Right hooks. Right? Mikey Garcia is going to know that. He's also going to know is that Spence is overly offensive. You even saw that his last fight, the first round knockout, where the guy he's fighting lands several body shots on Errol Spence. Right? Spence doesn't have a hand there. The guy's not squeezing the punches through a defensive construct. No, Spence is thinking offense. He's open here. Mikey is 5'6". He's going to be shorter. Mikey knows how to go to the body. Mikey knows how to block wide shots. Mikey knows how to throw straight right hands. So, I view this fight as an opportunity. Let's be real here. Spence is not going to outbox Mikey Garcia. That's all a gambler needs to know. So if you feel that if Spence is going to win this fight, it's going to be by KO. It's going to be the kind of war of attrition that had Kel Brook on the canvas. Okay, great. Have Spence by KO. Right? Spence by KO. By the way, nobody's knocked out Mikey Garcia. We know that, but have Spence by KO. And then, of course, that gives you the underdog, Mikey Garcia, to win the fight at better than even money odds. My point to you is Spence is so over-aggressive. He's so keen on trying to rough you up so he could say man down that you shouldn't be surprised if he doesn't get knocked out in this fight because he's going to be walking into shots against a puncher who's much bigger than 135 right now. Understand, there are videos online here of Mikey Garcia in the ring against bigger men in sparring, right? His brother runs a gym where people like Antonio Margarito came through, right? Several big names have fought under Robert Garcia, Mikey Garcia has been in the ring with world-class bigger men. Understand, too, to the boxing cognizante, when a future Hall of Famer, when a guy who's unbeaten, when a guy who's been champion in three different weight classes, looks at film and tells people close to him, this is the guy I want to fight. Understand, it's not even about the welterweight title. Mikey's not calling out. You know, Terrence Crawford, right? It's not about the welterweight title. Mikey's not calling out Manny Pacquiao, right? Those guys have belts. No, Mikey has looked at the film. It's this guy, Errol Spence, whose style fits his like a glove, right? Mikey knows Manny Pacquiao. I don't care how old Manny Pacquiao is. Just look at the film. Manny Pacquiao has the faster hands, right? I'm just telling you, Manny Pacquiao is perfectly positioned in boxing right now, right? Mikey Garcia knows, hey, I fight Manny Pacquiao. This guy hits hard. He's too sudden, right? That would be a problem. Mikey knows, I fight Terrence Crawford. This guy might be the best in the sport pound for pound, the absolute best. Right? When you look bad against Terrence Crawford, you look really bad against Terrence Crawford, as Jeff Horn just did. No, no, Mikey wants Errol Spence. Right? He's not calling out Keith Thurman. He wants Errol Spence. He knows a mid to short range hooker whose game plan is going to be to overwhelm him would be vulnerable to his hand speed, his straighter punches, his defensive ability, and his body punching. I think Mikey's right. If that fight's announced, I'll bet it early. I'll be taking Mikey, who I perceive to be the underdog. Right? I'll be taking Mikey to win. 
hedged with Errol Spence by stoppage. If I'm wrong, if Errol Spence walks through Mikey, if Mikey's too small, then I'll say, man, I was wrong about this fight. But I'll also be collecting. If I'm right, this will be the fight you remember in Mikey Garcia's career. All those other title fights and stuff are going to pale in comparison to this fight. It's like Ray Leonard. Right? Ray Leonard had a bunch of big fights against Hall of Famers, right? Wilfred Benitez, great fighter. Thomas the Hitman Hearns, great fighter. Roberto Duran, great fighter. Right? I'm just telling you, if you're of a certain age and you say Ray Leonard's name, Marvin Hagler's name might be in the same sentence or the next sentence. Right? That Hagler fight just dwarfs all these other fights. Keep in mind, after Hagler. Ray Leonard fought Hall of Famers. He fought terrible Terry Norris. Didn't do well against Terry, but all I'm saying is he fought Terry. He fought Hector Macho Camacho, right? He, he fought some great fighters after Hagler. That's all overshadowed, right? You think Ray Leonard, you think Hagler. You think Joe Frazier, you think Ali, right? I'm just telling you that Errol Spence would be a big scout on Mikey Garcia's resume, right? This is one of those times where I hope the fighter looks at people who love him, right? His father, his brother, and says, hey, this is the fight I want made. Let me also say this too in closing. I'm from the Lennox Lewis School of Thought, where fighters are the boss. I don't want to hear about, oh, the promoter wants the fighter to fight this guy, and that, no, no, no. I'm accustomed to fighters saying, look, I'm the guy putting it on the line. It's my health at risk. It's my legacy at stake. This is the fight I want. Make it happen. Right? The negotiation shouldn't even take that long because if you're fighting a guy who you want to fight, right, you'll find a way to make it happen. I hope this fight happens. I like Mikey Garcia to beat Errol Spence. I'll hedge the play with Spence by KO. I'm aware of the fact that Mikey, at least on paper, is jumping up two weight classes for the match. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.